Good afternoon, everyone. Come on in and get settled and we'll get started in just a second. You are in for a treat. All right, I promised everyone a treat and that is exactly what I have for you today for our members only webinar, our first one of 2023. I'm L'Oreal Lance, your member services director and I'm so excited to introduce CTAA's guru of all things regulations, census appropriations and every other federal word, word in between, Chris Zeilinger who's going to be giving us the ins and outs of urban area determinations based on the last census, the most recent census. So please put all your questions in the chat. Myself and Taylor on our team will be fielding them to Chris. I know that you have plenty of them. And without further ado, Chris, take it away. Well, thanks so much, L'Oreal, and good to see figuratively so, so many of our, our friends and colleagues joining us today. A couple other housekeeping things. One is we are recording this webinar, uh, which will probably be mean the audio and the slides, or at least the slides. Uh, but if you, for some reason, are conflicted with the idea of being on something that's recorded, now you know we're recording. Uh, secondly, there are a lot of people that signed up today, and there's probably a lot of questions, and we have only but so much time. So if you have something on your mind, that we don't have time to get to during today's session. Uh, take note of how my name is spelled on this intro slide because you can always drop an email to me at Zeilinger, Z-E-I-L-I-N-G-E-R at ctaa.org. Uh, there are other ways to reach me as well, but that one is guaranteed to, to, to work for us. Um, and I will be probably monitoring the chat a little bit myself, but I'm talking, so I'm counting on uh, L'Oreal and Taylor to you know, you know, give me the heads up towards the end uh, with questions that, that folks might have. Uh, this I will be pretty much talking through uh, about a dozen or so slides. So uh, if something just really creates some um, gnashing of your teeth or confusion or consternation, throw it in the chat, but we, I am aiming to have as much time as we can afford for Q&A via the chat box at the end. And again, please use the chat. Uh, there's a Q&A thing. I'm not going to pay any attention to that. So pay attention to the, the chat where it says on your Zoom screen, C-H-A-T. Anyway, um, why does any of this matter? Uh, well, just real basic. Uh, in the Fed and I'm going to talk about the Federal Transit Administration and how they use census data and how it affects you. Uh, two things. One is these urban area determinations that the Census Bureau made at the very end of December. They determine who's eligible for or what places are eligible for what sorts of FTA funding. In addition, where your community is placed in that scheme of things, that will determine how much money you're gonna get from FTA, not just next, actually not just two years from now, but for every year for a decade. So there's some pressure here. So like the folks in Bullhead Area Transit, whose bus is pictured here, that had been a rural transit system, uh, newly designated an urban area, they will, for the next decade, be getting some of their funds from section 5307 for small urban areas. Uh, so I just wanted you all to appreciate a picture of a bus from one of our country's newest urban transit systems as, as we're moving forward. Now, some quick things. Uh, I did a webinar for CTA actually several years ago on how census data and NTD data actually are used and got really in the weeds of how the formula funds work. 
but I wanted to do just a very quick overview. First of all, in the city of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, the mayor of Sioux Falls went on, on social media as he was affixing new population signs around the city limits. So I, I grabbed it. This is a screenshot I grabbed from Facebook, of, of all things. You'll notice that the city of Sioux Falls uh, city limits are now 208,884 population. But key reminder is that urban area boundaries do not follow municipal boundaries. The Sioux Falls urban area has a population of 194,000 and something or another. So the city limits go beyond what the census defined urban area is. I'm not going to get into the details of how urban areas were defined. I could, we would be here not just all afternoon, but all the, at this afternoon and tomorrow morning while I explain all of that. It's, it's fun, I love it, but I, I'm not gonna go there right now. Um, but another key thing is that the Census Bureau, and they're very, they're, they're more, they're kind about it now. They used to be really arrogant, but the Census Bureau, they're not responsible for what other federal agencies do with the stuff that they come up with. And so the Census Bureau has no responsibility for the fact that the Department of Transportation uses census urban, census population counts and urban area counts and so forth in making both federal highway and federal transit funding allocations. As the census folks will say, that's not their problem. That's the DOT thing. Go talk to DOT about that. A little vernacular here. In the world of the Federal Transit Administration, uh, the key threshold points are the 50,000 population mark for an urban area and the 200,000 population mark. Uh, for those really large urban areas, things get a little bit different over a million, but that really is kind of affects the inner workings of how the 5307 and related formulas work. Uh, we don't need to get into that today, I don't think. Uh, so our common vernacular, which we're actually going to have to evolve and change over the next year or two, is we've often referred to, quote, large urban areas as those places whose urban areas, urban areas have a population of 200,000 or more. Uh, we've often used the phrase, quote, small urban areas to talk about those urban areas that are between 50,000 and 200,000 population. And here, here's the thing. We need to come up with a word. I don't know what the word is. We've often used the word rural in some contexts to define places that are not that are below 50,000. That's probably not the right phrase because as census points out, they have urban areas that get down to, I think the smallest I found in the document that, that Scott referenced in the chat book, the chat box that's on our website is Munns Park, Arizona with a population of 787. Again, I can explain why that happened, but I, I, it's just, it's an interesting artifact. But the point is that urban areas are a lot of places that actually have some urban characteristics that are smaller than 50K. So to call a, a, you know, a, a place like um, Reed League, California with a population of 46,000 rural, it's not fair to, to Reed Lee, nor is it fair to, um, no, nor is it, it, it necessarily fair to the terminology, but we'll figure that out. I'll probably keep using the word rural just because it's only two syllables and will get us through a, a, a lot of stuff. Um, so one of the key things about how the census stuff worked is that, um, it, it, is that, everyone is angling to see where they made it. And so for instance, the, the uh, squeaker of the year, there's two of them. One of them is Huntington, West Virginia, which has been for the last 10 years in the over 200,000 cohort. Their urban area population now is 200,157 people. So they got over the line, stayed over the line just by having 157 people. The other squeaker of the year is Walla Walla, Washington, uh, whose urban area population is now 50,013 people, 13 people over the line. Walla Walla continues to be in, uh, mostly in the Washington state, a little bit in the Oregon, a little tiny bit in the Oregon 5307 small urban programs. Uh, the consolation prizes. Uh, Manesson, Pennsylvania, I think I pronounced that right. If you're from Southwestern Pennsylvania, forgive me if I bot botched your name. Uh, Manesson, Pennsylvania had been over 50,000, and now it is a population of 49,962 people. So it missed the mark by 38 good people in Manesson, short, uh, and so they're, they're no longer in the urban program. Uh, the real consolation prize, though, 
they're still urban, goes to Port Charlotte, Florida, whose population, urban area population, 199,998. Uh, that should beg a question in some of your minds, it's like the census allow for a recount? Not really, they make you pay for a special census. You can ask the folks in Flagstaff that did that back in 95, it can be done, but it's pretty darn rare. So what actually happened uh, with 2020? So I'm gonna just do a quick summary. Uh, there's a federal register notice that says it's published on December 29th with all the details and then some. Um, uh, but basically there were 19 places that used to be under 50,000 that jumped into the 50,000 cohort. Uh, there were a lot of cases where um, parts, you know, part, places have been part of a over 200,000 population urban area have been broken off into a separate newly formed urban area of 50,000 or more. Uh, there were 15 cases where small urban areas jumped over Port Charlotte didn't make it, but others did, jumped over the 200,000 population mark, 15 of those. Uh, there was one instance in the Bay Area of California where uh, part of the San Francisco, Oakland urbanized area was broken off into a new, into a separate, it's uh, San Rafael, uh, California, a new over 200,000, actually it's used to be this way, returned to be in its own over 200,000 urban area. Uh, uh, two urban areas, fell below the 50, 000, below the 20, 200,000 population mark. Uh, one of them, my, my friends in Visalia, California are not very happy about that. Uh, their counterparts over in uh, Eastern Connecticut probably also not very happy about that. Um, there were 12 urban areas that had been over 50,000, but like Manesson fell below the 50,000 mark. Again, the the, so, and then here's the thing that caught me by surprise is that because of how the urban areas were determined, I'll explain a little tiny bit about how this happened. There are 102 places that are still considered urban by census. Remember, urban can go down to uh, either 4,000 housing units or 5,000 population. Uh, but 102 places broken off from over 50K urban areas into something else. 20, at least 28 of those have transit programs that are no longer going to be 5307 transit programs. So there's some things to watch out for. Um, so summarize the quick thing here. Uh, I picked the fasten your seatbelt logo, not because I believe in safety, although I do, but some folks are gonna be in for a wild ride. So you better fasten your seatbelts for the next 10 years. Uh, first of all, as is true for every 10 years, uh, this is the fourth time around I've watched this party unfold. There are more urban areas over 50,000 population now than there ever were before. Each, each decade, they get more and more and more urban areas. We're up to almost 597. That's a good thing to keep in mind here. I'll get to that point in just, in just a, a minute or so. Uh, the other interesting thing is this census, um, I look back to 1990, I didn't go before to prior censuses, but at least since 1990 and probably before, the fewest number of brand new urban areas, fewest, only 27. That's, that's still, that's not, you know, chump change, but still, that's not a very big number. That's interesting. The other thing that is really interesting is Never, ever, ever before have there been so many urban areas that were wiped off the charts. Um, in a few cases, in, in a few cases, the, the, the one, they, they disappeared by being absorbed into another bigger nearby urban area. In most cases, um, they were those, they, they you know, you know, you know the, the the numbers that fell below 50k. That's it's, it's all unprecedented to have that many uh, that many urban areas that have been ur currently urban areas over 50k that are not going to be in that same way, shape, or form. Um, so, a couple other interesting things. You all know that I'm a mathy person. That's why I love census data. I can't help myself. Is the because of the changes 
primarily the changes in hop and jump criterion. I, I won't explain that to you. I could, it'll take a long time. Uh, almost every urban area that was in place in 2010 that still qualifies as an urban area in 2020 is smaller. Basically, the lots of qualifying census, previously qualifying census blocks have been shaved off, sometimes just a few, sometimes more considerable. I'll get into some use cases here in a moment from the edges of urban areas. So they're compact. Um, flip side, the population of what's left in these slightly smaller urban areas, the density has increased considerably. I uh, got the, these two uh, percentage change rates from, from some folks over at Census Bureau and it fascinated me. Um, so why does population density fascinate me? Well, let's do a quick refresher on how those three tranches of FTA formula public transit grants are, are, are distributed. The 5311 funds for all areas under 50,000, urban areas that are under 50,000 and rural areas um, is distributed primarily on the basis of population and land area with little bits kicked in for low income population and a little bit kicked in for vehicle revenue miles. So just it's a raw population thing primarily. In the small urban program, those, those of you between 50K and 200K, your areas are allocated funds almost exclusively on the basis of relative share of population and on population density. This is why we often have a lot of, a significant no, number of these urban areas that get FTA funding allocations, even though they don't have any at all public transit service, because the funds are not allocated on the basis of transit service stuff, other than the, the little bit of the smaller urban program that's a bonus for small transit and intensive communities. Larger urban areas over 200K, population and population density are factors, but they are factored much less than transit service characteristics, primarily your vehicle route miles and your bus route mile, miles. Um, so just th things are weighted differently in each of those. But the fact that for small urbans, transit service doesn't even affect how much, well, other than your stick, how much funds you get in your formula apportionments is an interesting thing to keep in mind. So here's the other interesting thing, actually kind of a, a scary thing to keep in mind, which is that, um, which is that, that unlike every time in the past, prior three times that I've watched this, the census numbers did not come out at the same time as a big funding boost and a transit authorization. So from fiscal 23, which will be the last year in which 2010 census data are used to fiscal year 2024. So you've got a year now, a little over a year because FTE still has to make their apportionments for 23. So you've got about a year probably that the FTA funds are only gonna increase 2.4%. That's not very much. A couple of things gonna, are gonna happen. Imagine the pies, the large urban pie. There's enough money there. It'll probably all work out. Some large urban areas, especially those uh, at the smaller end of the scale, near 200,000 population with not very much transit service relative to the size of the community, they might actually see some decreases, but most, uh, most of the allocations to large urban transit systems probably will be more or less okay. They just don't, not, might not be as the full boost that maybe some of those areas were expecting. The small urban program, when you're increasing the number of slices in the pie by 3%, and you're, but you're only increasing the size of the pie by 2.4%, there's not everyone's going to get a very nice slice of the pie. The rural areas, rural and urban under 50K, um, states are gonna have a lot on their plate. Remember that for places that are not over 50,000 population, those funds are distributed directly to the state. Again, based primarily on land area and population with a little bit of transit service kicked in there. The state decides what to do at that point. States are gonna have, I'll be quite honest, in a number of states, they're going to have some challenges on their hands about how are we going to give funds to everyone because you're going to have more participants in states 5311 programs than was previously the case. That will be, shall we say, interesting. 
Uh, we don't know the dollars involved. I am not about to try to guess how FTA fiscal 2024 apportionments are going to play out. There's too many moving pieces in that. Uh, I'll get into that, that some of the mechanics there in in a in a bit, um, but I'm not going to venture a guess as to who's going to gain how much or lose how much in 2024. Uh, hopefully, after they get the fiscal 2023 apportionments out the door, FTA staff will then have enough census data they can begin to do estimates of what 2024 might look like in those, those areas that are going to be most dramatically impacted. Hopefully, FTA will get the word out and we'll start to work with those states and those urban areas to see what can be done. Um, and, and I don't know, it might just be a few areas that get a little bit of shave. It might be some wholesale, wholesale disaster. I don't know, but someone's going to lose money. It might not be much, but it's going to be some transit providers that are going to lose some money in 2024. So uh, let's let's talk a little bit about what's actually happening. A couple of you all have already started emailing even before the webinar about some of this stuff. So important reminder, FTA will use these urban area criteria to make their fiscal 2024 apportionments. Not the, not the ones that we're waiting for right now that are for fiscal year 2023, but for the apportionments for a year from now. Now I could say, it's a year from now. There's a lot that needs to happen between now and then, but that's a year from now. Here's the, here's the part where, um, this, is, this is probably already painful, and it's probably going to continue to be painful uh, because in order to make the fiscal 2024 apportionments, FTA, they'll need the census data. They'll have the, those data in hand. That part's fine. But a lot of data are based on service criteria. And so FTA has already begun reaching out to, I don't know if they're reaching out to all. I think they're reaching out to those areas that are experiencing some flux, some change, um, that to either, if you haven't completed your in 2022 NTD data for that reporting year, report as if it's for, the, I mean, I'm getting the terminology wrong. FTA is doing a, their own webinar on this in, in two weeks be there and talk to FTA directly about this because I'll, I'll botch it up my explanation. But basically they're trying to get 2022 NTD data, NTD data that fit the new urban areas, even though in 2022, you weren't in those urban areas yet. Uh, if that, for some areas that have already locked down their 2022 reports, FTA will be working with you to see if you can report 2023 reporting year data to fit the new urban criteria. How that fits with current reality, I'm not quite sure. There's a lot about that NTD process and how it overlays urban areas. I still, 30 years, 30 plus years into this game, I'm still not sure if FTA knows how that works. So they're doing a meeting, a webinar on February 9th, be there. Uh, so, uh, so FTA is working on that part. Separately, I mentioned that we've never had as many currently urbanized areas and for 2010, the word was urbanized. Census doesn't use that word now, but they did in 2010, currently urbanized areas that fell below. Federal Highway Administration is trying to figure out what to do about that. In the past, um, I'll pick on uh, just a couple places. Um, uh, Enid, Oklahoma was urbanized, but then lost its urbanized area status in 20. In 1990, uh, whatever planning agency that had been in Eden was just, it kind of fell by the wayside. Uh, Sandusky, Ohio had been a small urban area, lost that status in 2010. Now in 2020 has just regained that status. My understanding was that the Federal Highway Administration, they knew that the Erie County, I believe Sandusky's in Erie County. Uh, if I got that wrong, my apologies. They knew that the Erie County Planning Commission used to be the MPO for the Sandusky area. They, they can't sub-allocate any funds. They can't authorize them to get any uh, federal highway or fe certainly no federal transit planning funds because it doesn't strictly exist. But at least they, they kept them on their email lists, so to speak, and some other communications. So they knew how, where to reach out to says, hey, is your gov governor gonna designate you as your MPO once again or what? Um, this year with 15, 
they're not quite sure what to do. Some of them are interesting cases. Uh, I'm, because of the webinar format, I can't do the, the you know, pop quiz type questions that most of you all know that I love to spring. But uh, if I were to ask you the pop quiz, you would all would correctly tell me that that picture on this slide is of Cumberland, Maryland, uh, which has a history of vacillating over and under the 50,000 mark. Beautiful city, uh, lots of history, lots of infrastructure. Uh, and this time around, fell below 50,000. Again, Allegheny County, Maryland, they're practically used to this, it seems. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they they grumble every time. But um, again, Federal Highway knows they're there, knows that if they go above 50,000, once again, they will be the MPO probably, depending on what the governor does. Uh, anyway, Federal Highway is working on that, trying to figure out what to do. Um, more generally, there's a lot of work on the MPO front, which I'll mention just briefly because one responsibility for MPOs metropolitan planning organizations in areas of 50,000 or more uh, is that they're supposed to be MPO boards and transit is supposed to be represented on those boards. So if you're in one of these new, newly designated urban areas of over 50,000 population, uh, someone should be contacting your transit agency for its representation on the MPO or its policy committee. Uh, so, but that's, a lot of that needs to happen. Most of that is all done at the state level, state and local level. Quick refresher uh, is that MPOs are, the MPO has to exist for the urban area. Uh, the MPO is, de MPO is designated by the governor in consultation with local officials. So it's like a local political thing. Uh, and then assuming they check all the right boxes, then they get recognized as such by Federal Highway and Federal Transit Administration. So those MPO designations have to be happening before, pretty much before fiscal 2024 is, is, is out. Um, I'm not sure what would happen if the MPO is dragging its feet. I heard through the grapevine that in 2010, Carbondale, Illinois, the local officials weren't even sure they wanted an MPO. Illinois DOT kind of like twisted their arm a little bit. They got the MPO. Now, of course, they're no longer urbanized, so I don't know if they're happy or not. Um, the other thing is that in newly urbanized, here I'm using that old word, areas that have newly crossed the 50,000 population threshold, um, each state does it a little bit differently, but supposedly all the, well, on the books, all the FTA formula grants for areas of between 50,000 and 200,000 population are distributed to the states, i.e. the state governor, which really means the state DOT. And then the state then chooses to allocate them or divvy them up among these small urban areas in the state. Uh, many times states simply designate one, a transit entity in the, that urban area as the direct recipient. Sometimes they, the state will make the, sometimes they'll just say, give that area its allocated amount. So the state doesn't have any wiggle room there, and there's there all kinds of permutations there. The state drives that bus, uh, but they'll need to figure that out. Um, and let's see. Um, the other thing that states are gonna have to do is figure out, because again, 5311 funds are distributed to the states. And, and so um, if I were, in a, if I were, for instance, Pennsylvania DOT, which lost more urban, formerly urbanized areas than any other you know, state in the country. Um, and so if I were PennDOT, Pennsylvania DOT, um, and I've got a challenge on my plate of uh, how am I going, how am I, I'm, I'm personalizing PennDOT here, but that's okay, they're, they're, they're nice people. How am I going to see that Manesson and Uniontown and Connellsville and California and East Stroudsburg and uh, Berwick Bloomsbury, I think it is. How are all these areas good, that had been urban going to be incorporated into the Commonwealth's 5311 program? That places the burden on the state. State gets to do what the state's going to do. So, um, so that that's kind of what's going to happen there. But the state needs to be ready for that. I'm not. I did a webinar similar to, or I did a. Zoom meeting, not even a formal presentation with a bunch of state DOTs a couple of weeks ago. I think they're starting to wise up, but uh, 
you know, the order of magnitude here is going to be pretty significant. Uh, the other thing that's happening, and this always happens, is that if there is one urban area with multiple tr public transit providers in that urbanized or urban area, something needs to be decided about to see who's going to get how much of the FTA funds and how's that process going to work. And in areas over 200,000 population, uh, where there's multiple areas, typically either the, the tip, a common practice, it's not universal, is that the one or more of the, 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 the if there's multiple major transit agencies, uh, they will negotiate, their local officials will negotiate what's called a split letter saying, we get this percent, they get that percent, and that's, and FTAs direct, will, will honor that. Again, defer, I'll defer to FTA for actual instructions on that. The other thing that can happen is that the major metro area, the major transit provider might be the recipient, but then they work out within their urban area how then the funds get distributed. Um, so for instance, in the Los Angeles, Long Beach, Anaheim area, where there's several major urban transit systems, and then, but there's a total of 143 FTA recipients of 5307 in the LA Long Beach Anaheim urban area. So not, the split letter is not, how do we take the urban area and split it up 143 ways? So there's lots of permutations there, but something will have to be negotiated. Uh, what sometimes happens, and hopefully that will not be the case this time around, is that um, say one transit agency might feel like it's all theirs. Uh, Everyone I know in South Carolina is super friendly and collegial. So what I'm speaking is, is a hypothetical, not a reality. But in 2020, uh, Clemson, South Carolina, which had been part of the Greenville, South Carolina, large urban area, has now been shifted over to be part of the Anderson, South Carolina urban area. So that means that Clemson area transit and the city of Anderson, which runs, which runs what's called electric city transit, They'll have to figure out between those two transit systems and maybe in conversation as well with South Carolina DOT about how do we determine what's Clemson area transit's portion, what's electric city, electric city transit's portion. So there's a lot of things there that just need to be negotiated. Negotiations take time. So I would certainly urge any transit system that is in an area that that's going to have for the first time multiple transit providers FTA recipients in that area, you might need to start um, getting getting their their um, agreements in place, negotiating about how do we want this to work. And again, if you're in areas under two hundred thousand population, the state is involved. If it's in an area over two hundred thousand population, you kind of sort it out amongst yourselves. Um, but we we can get into that. The other thing that I want to remind folks about is that everything that happens in 5311 and 5307 also holds true for 5310. So if an area uh, like Amarillo, Texas jumped over to the 200,000 population mark in 2020, that means that now in Amarillo, they will get their direct allocation of 5310 funds to meet the mobility needs of individuals with disabilities and older adults in Amarillo. Heretofore, that had been a tech stop function. Now, some states, the, the urban areas delegate that back to the state. Other places, they keep it for themselves, but it, there's still, it's a game changer. Uh, some places, it's gonna be really interesting. So uh, it's, it's, a bit of an outlier, but it's illustrative and it's a place that's very near and dear to my heart for because of some work I did there uh, in Southwest Indiana and that part of Northern Kentucky, um, the Evansville urban area has been and continues to be over 200,000 population. Up until now, the city of Henderson, Kentucky, which is about 36,000 population, had been part of the Evansville urban area. Now, it's not. Henderson, Kentucky is now a place of 36,000 that is not part of any urban area. And therefore, anything that was happening in that portion of what used to be the Evansville urban area 
is now between the local folks and the Kentucky Transportation Cabinet. So for instance, if, because uh, as I recall, Evansville MPO, MPO uh, was the recipient of that metro, that urban area's 5310 funds. If they were in the habit of making 5310 awards in Henderson, starting with 2024, they won't be doing that because that's not part of their area. Um, and any 5310 recipient in Henderson will now have to participate in the Commonwealth of Kentucky's 5310 program for quote, rural areas. Similarly, Henderson Area Transit will now be a 5311 subrecipient to the to Kentucky Transportation Cabinet through their 5311 program. So there's some changes that are taking place there. It gets kind of lots of stuff that gets shifted around there. So that's why at least we've got a year to kind of sort some of this stuff out and prepare for it. So I'm just going to do a quick rundown uh, to whet your appetite and see what, what questions get generated that we have time to answer. And again, if you have something that is either a unique situation or that we don't have time, shoot me an email, zeilinger at ctaa.org, Z-E-I-L-I-N-G-E-R at cta.org. And I'll get back to you with what I know uh, or what thoughts I might have or colleagues of yours that had been in prior censuses in a similar boat so you can know what others have done. So several things have happened this time around there, and then I'll talk about what has not really happened. Uh, in some places, there have been places that have shifted from being in one urban area to being part of another. I mentioned Clemson. Another one that fascinates me, all things, Cal I'm a native Californian, so all things California fascinate me, was in east of the East Bay, Eastern Contra Costa County, I think it is. Uh, Livermore Amador Valley Transit Authority has always served the cities of Livermore, Dublin, and Pleasanton. Up until now, Livermore was a small urban area, Dublin and Pleasanton were part of the Concord Walnut Creek urban area. And so everything, they, LAVTA, LAVTA, had a challenge to figure out how do we do our NTD reportings and how do we work it out so that we get the proper shares of 53 or 7 funds from these two different urban areas. Now they're all one urban area. You know, for them, life will actually be easier starting next year. Not a bad deal. I mentioned Clemson. Another case was Riverhead, New York. This one caught me by surprise. Far North Fork of Long Island, uh, it's actually Riverhead Southhold, has been like almost all of Long Island, part of the New York City urban area. Now for this first time, it's broken off and be it's part of its own, in, in Riverhead's case, under 50,000 urban area. Will that be good for them or not? We'll see. But um, a lot of times, you know, people are excited. I was just talking with a planner from the San Antonio area who said that the folks in New Braunfels, Texas, which is newly broken off from San Antonio, they're ecstatic because they look at 5307 allocations and hopefully TxDOT will agree with this interpretation. If not, you'll need to tamp down some, hope, some hopes in New Braunfels. They're hopeful that because of their new status as their own urban area, that they can use their 5307 allocations in New Braunfels to get better, more intensive transit service than what Alamo Regional Transit was able to provide when they're part of the larger San Antonio area. We'll see. I'm, well, I'll follow up with those folks. Uh, the, the standing joke around CTA is that I have, I've either lived in a place or, been, or have family in a place. I've got family in New Braunfels, so I'll check up to see if they're, what kind of transit service they're getting. So, yeah, so that's one type of thing that happens. The other thing is the absorption. There wasn't very much of that this time around. Uh, and in fact, I listed three examples because this was the only time where this happened in this current census. Uh, actually, there's one other, but it's also in the in New Jersey, so I'll skip that. Uh, Cape May County, New Jersey, was has been all and has been part of the Villas, New Jersey, smaller urban area for I think 20 years now, at least 10 years, no, 20, 20 years. Uh, and so the Cape May County Transit, uh, Fair, Fair Free Transit, Fair Free Transit of Cape May County, has been a smaller urban transit system. Starting with 2024, they are now part of the Atlantic City, over 200,000 population urban area. So those folks in Cape May will need to be duking it out with the folks in Ocean County, New Jersey, to see what are the area's allocations are for Atlantic City itself, what are them for Cape May. They've got to work that out. Uh, Pottstown, Pennsylvania just totally disappeared. Poof, it's now part of Philly. Galveston, Texas, my Texas friends will know that Galveston has wrestled with its status and identity to see his, 
unfortunately, like they lost a lot of population on the census books because the census count was right after, like I think it was a major hurricane or something like that. I forget now, you know, you know, 10 years ago uh, and was like practically thrown into the rural program. Now there's the Texas City Galveston area. Galveston is now part of that solidly over 200,000 population. I'm looking at that, I'm thinking, oh, Galveston's FTA formula funding will probably be in a more secure spot, at least for the next 10 years and probably beyond just because of that. So that happens. Um, I've talked about places that get broken off from, from areas. I mentioned Henderson. This is just a couple other illustrative places. Uh, Matawan, Michigan. I'm just mentioning that because we used to have a CTA employee who's from Matawan. It is on the outskirts of Kalamazoo. It's actually over in a neighboring county. Here's where it gets interesting. For the last 10 years, and I'm blanking out on the name, but the Kalamazoo MPO had to incorporate a neighboring county, Van Buren County, in their MPO. And Kalamazoo Metro had to do something about the folks in Matawan that were part of their urban area, over 200,000 population. They worked out a deal where there's a Van Buren public works person, I think it was, who had a seat on the MPO board and the Kalamazoo Transit every so often would basically make a capital investment, basically do a bus replacement for Van Buren Public Transit. It was a nice agreement, it worked out very well. They don't have to do that anymore. Uh, and in fact, Kalamazoo had better not be spending any 5307 funds on Van Buren starting in 24 because it's not part of their urban area. So things like that are happening. Then there are hardly any cases where uh, new areas were added into urban areas. Remember what I said earlier that in 2020, the way the census worked, almost every urban area shrank. So it's very rare that any place was added on, formerly rural area was added onto a place. Um, I found three of actual significance. None of them have transit. Uh, Seaside, Florida, it should have had transit. Uh, and if any of you ever watched the movie, the, the, the Truman Show, it came out, gosh, probably 10, 15 years ago. Uh, it was set in a planned community modeled after Seaside, super planned community. Now they're part of the Fort Walton Beach urban area. Uh, New Buffalo, Michigan, it's a case where it's now part of the Michigan City, Indiana area. That means that the, two that the Southwest Michigan Regional Planning Commission and the whatever they call the planning body for, for Michigan City, needed to negotiate, well, who's gonna do the transportation planning for New Buffalo? As far as I know, there's no rural transit in New Buffalo, so no one's losing or being swallowed up. So very few cases of, of absorption. It's more, this is a census in which things are being broken off. Um, and there are the places that had been 50K plus fallen below. I've already mentioned several of them, a couple others. Um, I'll talk about Westminster, Maryland. I'm not sure if they're on in today's webinar, but uh, Carroll Transit Services, Carroll County Transit, um, has, has been for the last 10 or maybe 20 years, a small urban transit provider serving Westminster and Eldersburg as a small urban transit system. Not anymore. Um, Carroll Transit is one, will again become part of the rural 5311 funded uh, locally operated transit systems in the, in the state of Maryland. So that will be an adjustment for them. It will be an adjustment for the Maryland MTA. I will, oh, all right, Westminster's here. Uh, I hope I didn't you know, burst your bubble, Heidi. Uh, that you actually saw this coming. And as a Marylander, I'll make sure that I pay my, my, my share of taxes so that you can keep as much of Carroll Transit going as popular. Um, uh, another interesting thing that is probably not statistically significant, but it's still interesting. A lot of cases of realignment. Um, again, you know, there's an area, and this is for my Maryland peeps. There's an area where Montgomery County, Carroll County, and Frederick County all come together. It's a city of about right under 10,000 population called Mount Airy. Uh, historically, Mount Airy has been part of the Washington DC urbanized area, which meant that its population figures you know, if you know, Transit of Frederick or if Carroll Transit were actually providing service in Carroll County, Washington you know, DC Metro was, was basically getting credit for any transit service you reported as being part of the DC urbanized area. Uh, not anymore. Now Mount Airy has been shifted out of DC and over into Frederick, 
into the Frederick urban area. So Roman and his folks, you know, does that mean you have to serve Mount Airy? That's up to you. That's a local decision. Um, you'll, you'll, you'll do what's right from a transit operational point of view. What that does mean is that Mount Airy's uh, 10,000 population is added, included in the population figure that is part of Frederick's allocation. Uh, Mount Airy's population density of around um, 2,300 people per square mile will be will influence the Frederick urbanized area's population density. So even, even if uh, transit doesn't run any buses out to Mount Airy, it will influence the amount of money that transit of Frederick gets. So that's kind of the way that that works. Now that is kind of where I, I want to kind of start to phase into the Q&A and other things is Mount Airy is a perfect illustration of what all y'all need to be doing now, which is um, looking at the data and trying to figure out what it's likely to mean in your place because every place will be different. Most places, probably not much change. We get all tied up into knots and some of us need to get tied up into knots either because we care or because we're impacted. Uh, most places don't have dramatic changes, but if you, you should look at the data and find out if your area is going to experience some kind of significant Locally significant change. I, I used a phrase, and in fact, I, 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 I you know, I, I, I got a, a chuckle from some census colleagues of mine. I said, "This is a census with a lot of marginally significant changes in urban areas, and emphasis being significant, but it is marginal. It's things around the edges. That's what you need to look out for." Um, so, a couple, few resources, and again, the the slide deck will be part of the recording that's made available. I will provide it on request to anyone who emails me if you just want these slides. Uh, but here's a few places that you all should be, if, you're, if these matters are important to you, you should keep an eye on them. Uh, the Census Bureau has a page that it was where my source list of urban area changes were, where the explanation of urban area criteria, as they start to officially roll out their data products, those will be available through their urban rural page. They'll also be, it'll eventually be populating your GIS packages and things like that as well. Uh, Federal Highway Administration has a census page. Uh, right now it's, uh, no offense to Federal Highway, but they're a little bit behind the, the times, but they know what they need to do. They just, you know, they're an agency that plays it safe. So they don't want to put out too much speculative information as they have official things with regard to the 2020 census. They have a landing spot for that, so you might want to keep an eye on that page. Again, that will be mainly around uh, MPO designation and uh, with links to where and how to program federal highway funds that are sub-allocated to different le levels of urban, urban area. But for some of you, that could actually be important stuff. So that's the page. FTA, I I've got to give them credit. They have gone all out on trying to provide as much information as is available as soon as it's available. So take a look at the transit.dot.gov slash census page. Um, they've got, you know, again, they're not going to put out speculative information. So, but anything that they do have to say that's definitive on census stuff will be on that page. Uh, they did do, and I think a lot of you have already started looking at this. I know I have, uh, is they've got the, uh, John Georges from FTA basically got the, the new urban area data from census, uh, even before the rest of us could, and created maps. It's got a US map. In, I mean, it's, you have to have a little bit of ArcGIS you know, comfort to, to navigate it, but once you figure it out, you can have a lot of fun. I have it, I find it fun. Uh, and you can sort of see the actual implications. You can zoom in, zoom out, and so forth. So, uh, but there's some good stuff there. And again, as official agency stuff gets issued, It'll be on those pages. So really make sure that you're looking at that. The other thing is that if you're not already, you'll be getting communications from FTA. Pay attention to those. Uh, a lot of it will be handled through your FTA regional office. Here's a key thing to keep in mind is that if you are in an area that's below 50,000 population, or uh, if you're in a state where the small urban transit systems are all subrecipients to the state DOT, FTA is, is more likely to be communicating to your state than to you. 
Uh, so you've got to maintain some relationships with your state DOT who are, again, are getting up to speed on a lot of these issues. We're all in this together learning what all this means. This was, as I said at the beginning of my slideshow here, this is a census whose results are unlike any that I've seen in, in 30 plus years. Um, some things are, are dramatic and the things that are normally dramatic didn't even happen. Uh, one, one final footnote before we go into Q&A is some of you know that I have a fascination with tribal nations and their urban areas. Uh, so I looked at the maps to see what I could discern. Um, and also with like 200 of you all as my witnesses, I can say that uh, up till 2010, the Catawba Nation in South Carolina, their tribal population, their nation's population was mostly in the Rock Hill urban area of South Carolina, even though the reservation was mostly rural. And I was worried that when Rock Hill became an over 200,000 population, that would really create a challenge for that, that, that tribal nation because they've been getting 5311C or whatever the tribal transit funds are. I was pleased to look at John's maps and see that the Catawba Nation, because of Rock Hill's shrinkage in land area, the Catawba Nation is now definitely outside that area. Sigh relief for them. My friends in Washington State, you have an interesting situation with the uh, Lummi Nation in up near the Marysville urban area where more of that tribal nation's population has been engulfed in the urban area. Work with folks, work with your Puget Sound Regional Council, work with the tribal leaders because they're, they're an FTA grantee, uh, sort something out. So that's a homework assignment. So at that point, I think um, I'm about ready. To, I'm ready to start fielding those Q's, Q and A's that we have. We only have like about 10 or 11 minutes. So a lot of you might end up emailing me, parting shot. Uh, this bus that you see with the bike rack, that is Josephine Community Transit in Grants Pass, Oregon, newly designated in 2010. So this is a good reminder that the new census designations can be your bus to the future if we all play it right. So at this point, I will turn things over to my colleagues to field some questions and answers for while we have time. Yes. So the first question we received is from a rich and he's saying we are a newly disappeared urban area, East Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania. Is there any history of the census looking over the numbers again and reversing their decision? Uh, the short answer is no. Census will not do that. Uh, census, they, their number one thing is the integrity of their data. They don't, and this is where they'll start raising a, a fuss about we, we're not responsible for what DOT does. Uh, there has been history that in Galveston and one of the cycles when C Cumberland fell off where Congress overwrote the census and legislatively designated an area to be urban census figures notwithstanding. So if you need your independence and willing to fight for it, Rich, uh, talk to your congressional delegation, see if they can help you out. Thank you, Rich, for that question. Next question. Brandy asked, if a new rural area is formed, but they have no transit program, are they still el eligible for 5311 funds? Okay, so if you're in a, an area of your state that is not an urban area over 50,000, then you're eligible. It doesn't matter whether there's transit there or not. Uh, the state gets the money. You know, some states allocate everything by formula to their local recipients. Other states just hold on to it and allocate it based on needs and, and applications. So that's largely a question, going to be a largely a question between you and the state you're in. Thank you, Brandy, for your question. Next one. Roy asked, how do we find out what the change will be if a county is mostly urban but with rural pockets, the transit system services all areas? This has been one of those things that is always vexing from a census data point of view is census does just care what county, what parts of the county are urban and rural. Um, every situation is different. Um, and I will, you know, I, I would just point you to some of your peers. Uh, we can follow it separately, but there's a lot of transit systems that have a history of serving both urban and not quite so urban parts of their county with their transit system. Some cases it's it all works neatly. Some cases they sometimes just look the other way because a bus stop happens to be on the wrong, the, the non-urban side of the street or what have you. Uh, so there's ways to make that work. There's precedent there. Great, thank you. Another question. If an MPO, transit agency, municipality, et cetera, disagrees with the urban area boundaries, is there recourse to change the boundaries? No, 
uh, quite honestly, census isn't going to do that. Uh, they will. Now there's here's where FTA is in a, FTA programs are in a weird spot. Federal Highway Administration lets MPOs smooth their MPO boundaries so that if you the the F, Federal Highway rationale is if I've got this secondary road that the it's got like its generate its traffic generators are in the unarguably urban area, but the road itself traverses some non-urban area just because of the weird way that census block boundaries that, that define the official urban area, I can smooth the boundary so that the whole thing is part of the urban road network under my program. Uh, this in my programming is the MPO. The FTA doesn't have that authority. So um, it, it, it's a weird box to be in. So yeah, it's it, you can't get, you're not gonna get census to redraw draw the boundaries. They'll tell you to wait 10 years. Uh, or they'll string you along for 10 years and just not do it. So yeah, that's that's kind of the way that works. Thank you. Okay, we got a new sort of question coming up. Brian asked, when a UZA goes well beyond the city limits in a city, I think over 200,000 population, does FTA push the funding for the new land included in the existing urbanized area outside of the city limits to the 5307 provider or to the 5311 provider? Would it be up to transit systems or the officials? In this example, the 5307 provider only serves the land area inside the city limits, and the 5311 provider has been serving the areas outside of the city limits, but still inside the UZA. Wow. <laughs> uh, I mean, there are cases where, where, where things like that do just from operational necessity end up happening. Um, something needs to be arranged. Uh, and every place is different, but arrangements can be made. Um, and so it could be, you know, it, it basically I, I, I'm, I'm thinking about my friends in, in the rural area surrounding Des Moines as I'm reflecting on that question, even though I don't think that's where the question came from, which is you need to get the NPO, the, the quote 5307 recipient and the 5311 recipient and maybe the state to all agree on what's being done and that it's okay. Just get everyone seal, kind of seal of approval on there. Uh, word of the wise, don't involve FTA because it'll confuse you. Uh, you can work something out. And again, we can follow up offline and, and figure out how to help you through those particular scenarios in, in, in the places you're at. Great, thanks. We have a couple more questions, but I will just forward them to you, Chris, so you can touch okay. base with um, the rest of them offline. I wanted to say quickly, uh, thank you so much again, Chris, for providing all of this fabulous information. I don't think there's anyone else like you out there. So thank you. I know our members appreciate it. We appreciate it. Um, for those who are still on the line, I did want to remind everybody that we just opened Expo registration. So make sure to check out that. Our schedules has been released. We are working on releasing workshop information next month. Um, we are already working on our next February webinar. So stay tuned for that. Keep checking your emails from us. And thank you all very much and have a great rest of your day.